Welcome everyone. We have a special speaker today. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Banks. William A. Banks, who received his MD from the University of Missouri in Columbia in 1979. He completed clinical training in internal medicine and later in endocrinology and metabolism at Tulane uh, and at the VA in, in New Orleans. He was awarded a Career Development Award by the VA Veterans Affairs from 82 to 85 and became full professor at Tulane in 1995. In 1998, he moved to the VA and St. Louis University School of Medicine, where he is currently staff physician and where he is currently staff physician and principal investigator, professor in the Department of Internal Medicine and the Department of Pharmacologic and Physiologic Sciences, and visiting professor of anatomy at Showa University in Tokyo, Japan. In 2010, he moved to Seattle as Associate Director of Research for the Geriatric Research Educational and Clinical Center at the VA, and as Professor in the Division of Endocrinology and Geriatric and Gerontology and Geriatric Medicine, Department of Internal Medicine. So he's here with us now. He's published over 400 articles, mostly related to the functioning of the blood-brain blood -brain barrier and is on 12 editorial boards, including being Editor-in-Chief of Current Pharmaceutical Design. He has received numerous awards, including membership in the Musser Birch Society, Tulane's Clinical Honor Society, the VA Star Award, the 1994 University of Missouri St. Louis Distinguished Biology Alumni Award, the 1998 Outstanding Young Physician Award from the University of Missouri School of Medicine, and is the 2004 Milton D. Overholzer Memorial Lecturer. He belongs to numerous scientific organizations and is a past president of the New Orleans chapter for the Society for Neuroscience and is a charter member of the American Peptide Society as well as many other appointments. It's a pleasure to introduce you. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming today. Uh, it's, it's rather tough to give talks in Seattle because you can go hiking so much of the year that, you know, in the Midwest we've usually had ca captive audiences this time of year. Uh, as you can see, I've greatly expanded my talk to uh, blood-brain barrier neurology and psychiatry. And um, I thought that it might be good to start to sort of see where the state of the art is, where, how inculcated this field is. Uh, and I decided to do that by looking at textbooks. First, I looked at some uh, neurology textbooks, and uh, more or less, there would be, for every volume of text, there would be maybe one paragraph on the blood-brain barrier. So the neurologists are doing a pretty lousy job at this. Just by comparison, I picked out obesity. I mean, you know, what does obesity have to do with the brain? And there's two paragraphs on that. Of course, psychiatry did much better. You have two or three paragraphs uh, and five entries, but you've got 31 entries on obesity. So. Uh, I guess I have to start sort of at the beginning. So the first question is, is this really an important topic, I think, for psychiatry? Um, and actually, I, at, when I sort of did this critical self-analysis, I only found three areas that this is really important. Um, if you're interested in normal function of the brain, then blood-brain barrier is a critical part of that. Uh, for example, here I've got it's important in nutrient delivery. Um, if you're interested in dysfunction of the brain, then it's critically important. For example, when that nutritional uh, deficit occurs, uh, and there's a familial dementia syndrome where there's only 50% of the transporters needed across the blood-brain barrier for glucose, that's called the vivo syndrome. Um, or if you're interested in drug delivery to fix those problems in the brain. So those are the only three categories, normal brain, abnormal brain, and drug delivery to fix the abnormal brain. So if you're not interested in that, you can like do your iPhone thing. Um, and uh, drug delivery is a big problem. We'll spend some time on that. But before we go to the main part of the lecture, just to give you a sense of some of the other areas, immune cell trafficking is very important. Of course, that's important in path uh, pathological diseases like HIV, neuroAIDS, uh, multiple sclerosis, and those that we create, such as PML. Uh, pathogen entries of various kinds, uh, rabies or measles or bacteria or parasites, 
it's not that the blood-brain barrier is blasted open and things leak in. Rather, there's an ongoing negotiation of the, of these, of the pathogens with the BBB. And uh, if you can't speak that language, you can't get into the CNS. Um, neurotoxins get into the brain, and again, almost all of those are controlled processes, be it iron or uh, prion diseases or aluminum and dialysis dementia. Cytokines are transported across the blood-brain barrier, and I'll give you an example of how that's important in a couple of diseases or a couple of conditions. And we now know within the last few years that the cells that, constitu that, can, that form the blood-brain barrier also secrete neuroimmune and neuroactive substances. These are important in several aspects. And finally, the area that my lab has been most interested in has been the transport of regulatory substances across the blood-brain barrier as part of a brain-to-blood communication axis. When that goes awry, uh, diseases uh, result. And I'll give you evidence, uh, well, a little bit stilted perhaps, how Alzheimer's disease and obesity can both be considered diseases of the blood-brain barrier. Um, and um, we'll see if that flies. So my lecture will more or less fall into four categories. First, I'll give you an introduction to what the blood-brain barrier is. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about drug delivery, uh, and we'll do some classic drug delivery and sort of bring you up to the state of the field now. So that, of course, will have to be kind of an overview, cursory review, but I think that's a very important aspect for you. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how the blood-brain barrier can actually be involved in regulating a behavior. Finally, we'll talk about some of the work in my lab on Alzheimer's disease and the role of the blood-brain barrier there. And you'll see sort of a transition as I go here from classic literature uh, as we move through. I'll, I'll start including more and more of the work from, from our lab. So we might as well start at the beginning. Let's say circa 1880, 1890, Paul Ehrlich, who won the Nobel Prize, uh, in 1908 for the discovery of the magic bullet, essentially antibiotics. Uh, as a student did this kind of study, he would inject dyes into animals and he would look at the distribution of the dye. And here we've injected Evans blue and you see all the tissues are kind of blue and everything. But if we look inside the skull, if we look at the, at the brain, we see almost no, no staining at all. Now if we come over here and we look at the inside of the cranium, what we see this is the inside of the cranium, has no blood-brain barrier. This is just bone and a little tissue, and it's already so blue you can barely see it. If I showed you the kidney or the liver or the heart, it'd be so dark you couldn't see it. And yet here, less than a millimeter away, is, um, is the brain, no staining at all. So Ehrlich actually got it wrong. The brilliant Eric got it wrong. He thought that brain tissue just couldn't be stained. But it was, uh, fell to uh, actually one of his students some 20 years later, who did the obverse experiment, injected the dye directly into the brain, showed that it could stain, voila, there was evidence for some barrier between the circulation and the central nervous system. Unfortunately, many people think this is what the blood-brain barrier looks like, some sort of rigid external coating around the, the central nervous system with some holes for things to leak in. And if there's any slide that you can sort of take away from this, this is a negative model. This idea is, pardon the pun, this, this is a medieval view of the blood-brain barrier. A much more useful model is this, to think about the capillary bed of the brain. The capillary bed of the brain is modified in three major ways to prevent leakage of materials. First, wherever the endothelial cells come together, they're cemented by tight junctions. Secondly, there are no intracellular pores or holes, fenestre, here. Uh, and finally, there is very little macropenocytosis. You can see a few uh, little uh, places like right about there, there's a, there's a penocytotic vesicle. But if you compare this to the capillary bed of, say, the heart, uh, you can see how much less uh, activity there is going on. Now, on the one hand, this is great because this keeps all the circulating riffraff in the blood out of the central nervous system. Gives it a pristine area, pristine area in which to, uh, to work. And this is really a substantial barrier. For every uh, 200 molecules of albumin in the circulation, there's one molecule in the cerebral spinal fluid. And actually, that doesn't get in at the capillary bed. It gets in through backdoor pathways. So this is a substantial barrier. But although this is good on the one hand, it's also a problem on the other hand because if the central nervous system isn't creating an ultrafiltrate, that's how most tissues are uh, nourished. How does the CNS get everything that it needs to, to work? And as you know, it's a big time user of glucose and other, uh, other nutrients. And the modern view of the blood-brain barrier comes to this as well because it's endowed with transporters. There's transporters into the brain and out of the brain, 
and bidirectionally. And by this, the blood-brain barrier uh, plays a great number of roles. Now, we've realized that it doesn't do this below. This is the John Doan no cell is an island slide. Uh, we now know that the brain endothelial cell and the other uh, uh, aspects of the blood-brain barrier, like the cerebral spinal fluid uh, blood uh, barrier, are in constant communication with the other cells of the central nervous system, particularly the, macro, the microglia, the pericytes, and the astrocytes, and the neurons, uh, as well as the, the immune cells and the uh, other substances circulating in the blood. So this is a neurovascular unit. And what this means is that the blood-brain barrier is, amongst other ways of looking at it, the middle part of a sandwich. Uh, that's the regulatory point with a, if a humoral brain-to-blood and blood-to-brain communication system between the peripheral tissues and the central nervous system. So that the extra barrier roles of the blood-brain barrier, after keeping all these things out, then it plays all these roles by selectively letting things in. It plays as a nutritional role, homeostatic role, and the role that I think is most interesting and that our lab has worked on is the role of communication by regulating informational molecules into, inside and out of the brain. So I love summary slides. This summarizes everything I've said. Um, the uh, brain is connected to the body by uh, two arms, if you will. On the one hand, we have the, the uh, nervous system uh, connecting the brain and the peripheral tissues, and on the other hand, we have the blood-brain barrier this heart of the sandwich, this middle part of the sandwich, and the humoral communication, endocrine-like role on the blood-brain barrier. So I now want to uh, switch over a bit to talk about uh, drug delivery. Um, and you, because if you think about it, if you want to treat a disease of the brain, you're probably going to have, you're probably going to do that with a drug, and the drug's got to get to the brain, which means negotiating the blood-brain barrier. There are a limited number of ways in which you can cross the blood-brain barrier, uh, we talked about transport systems, membrane diffusion, um, those, that residual leakage, which is now reified as extracellular pathways. And another interesting aspect, absorptive endocytosis and diapedesis, which are used mostly by toxins, which we don't want in, by immune cells, uh, and sometimes co-opted by viruses and bacteria and that kind of thing. But from the drug delivery point of view, it's really interesting uh, almost all the drugs we use get in by membrane diffusion. Just a quick caveat, leakage extracellular pathways are probably the pathway taken by antibodies, as those are becoming relatively interesting from the treatment of AD. Satchable transport systems, very few drugs have we co-opted there. L-dopa and denepazole are, are, are two examples that use uh, transporters. Uh, but uh, membrane diffusion is the major one. And the way this works is that the drug sort of melds into the membranes that form the blood-brain barrier and pop out on the other side. Um, so the characteristics of the, uh, m of the chemical of the drug are to, of course, this is a non-satchable system, and so the more you dump into the blood, the more that gets into the brain. Uh, lipid solubility is the major factor. Uh, and the smaller you are, the better it is. The square root of the molecular weight, which is a rough uh, indication of volume, is, a, is often considered also. Some of my favorite drugs get into the brain this way. Uh, meth uh, ethanol and morphine and, and nicotine. Um, there's a very important vitamin, however, that is transported across the blood-brain barrier called caffeine. It's a vitamin for me, believe me. And... Um, I, I think that, you know, if you think about it, particularly since coffee is so popular here in the Northwest, if it weren't for the blood-brain barrier transporting caffeine, every cup in the world would be essentially decaffeinated. I think that's really a scary thought. I thank my blood-brain barrier every morning when I get up and have my first cup of joe. So this is uh, a classic example of how we use lipid solubility uh, to get drugs into the brain. Morphine actually doesn't cross very well. It's rather water-soluble. And so if you put a methoxy group on it, you can get codeine. Or if you put still even more lipid-soluble drugs uh, components on, you can really get the thing to zip in, like a heroin or a methadone. Um, and, but, so you would think that drug development would be very easy. All you've got to do is make things lipid-soluble. But it uh, sounds like you've already read the cartoon. Uh, we have a, you know, I think it's pretty obvious. So um, you can have too much of a good thing. That's, that's the uh, point here. And one reason you can have too much of a good thing is imagine you're a molecule. And uh, what you've got to do, you've got to, first of all, get into, be soluble enough to stay in the aqueous environment of the blood to reach the blood-brain barrier. You then have to partition yourself into this luminal membrane, 
then back into the uh, cytoplasm, another aqueous membrane, back into another lipid membrane, the abluminal uh, membrane that's facing into the blood, and then finally back into the aqueous environment of the, uh, of the uh, uh, interstitial fluid or cerebrospinal fluid. And so you have to sort of have uh, this, you, have, you can't be totally lipid soluble, otherwise you'll, you'll inculcate into the membranes and get trapped there. So that's one way you can have too much of a good thing. Um, all, uh, you're being taken up by all membranes by this mechanism, and sometimes you can so overshoot that um, you're taken up so well by the peripheral tissues, particularly the liver, that uh, your blood levels drop low and there's actually less amount of the drug crossing because it's just the blood levels are low. What's in the blood crosses well, but the, 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 but what can get stay in the blood uh, is decreased because of changes in pharmacokinetics, half-life, and volume of distribution. For reasons we don't quite understand but are actively being investigated, you can get a PGP substrate. That's a brain-to-blood efflux system. We'll talk more about that. Or you can even become too powerful. Consider uh, how much more powerful heroin is than morphine, uh, but we tend to use morphine clinically and not heroin, at least professionally. And um, also there's an example from Romer way back in Nature days, uh, sorry, way back in 1977 when he published in Nature some uh, opiate peptides that he had fluorinated. And these got in so well that they were, they were neurotoxic. So we can get too much in, and this is actually a very interesting aspect of drug development. Unlike the liver or the kidney or something like that, uh, we don't really need that much drug in the brain in most cases. Uh, in morphine, only one molecule of 5,000, 0.02%, will enter the, the, the brain of the mouse after an intravenous injection. And that's enough to do all kinds of interesting things. So the lipid-soluble membrane also is uh, studded with proteins, and some of these proteins act as transporters. Um, and there's transporters for essentially everything in the, that the brain needs, and there are transporters directed in the other direction too. These, as I've already said, are often co-opted by viruses, and there's mechanisms that are somewhat transporter-related to the way that cells get in. Again, an area that's sort of been neglected from drug development. Uh, but this is what you get if you can find a transporter uh, to transport your substance. Again, this is a curve that shows on the uh, x-axis the lipid solubility of a substance and on the y-axis an index of how much of it is getting into the brain. And if you look over to the part that's in the dotted circle, these are substances that are not very lipid soluble. The king, of course, is probably going to be glucose, although some amino acids in too. In general, the transporters allow them to get in between 10 and 100 times or 20 to 40 times faster than they would than if they had used membrane diffusion. So uh, there's, um, however, a caveat for drug development. Even though we haven't been very successful in using drugs to get into the brain, it comes back and visits us in a different way because, again, there's the luminal and abluminal membrane to the blood-brain barrier. These are very different, not only in terms of the lipid matrix, but also in terms of the proteins and the uh, transporters that are there. So the brain side has unique transporters often from those in the blood side. And this allows the brain to have brain-to-blood efflux pumps in addition to those that are transported in. And I really like efflux pumps. They're so cool. My favorite is the, uh, is the tobacco worm. How can, how can this worm eat this plant that is really toxic to every other species in the world? And the, uh, what passes for the brain of a, of a worm um, has uh, a, anything essentially that has something that can more or less be like nervous tissue and anything that can more or less be like blood has something more or less in between those two that acts as a barrier uh, and a regulatory interface. So the, so the worm has this transport system to keep nicotine out of its brain. Um, Lamotil is very interesting. If any of you have children, your children have had diarrhea, you may have given them Lomotil to stop the diarrhea. How does Lomotil work? It's an anti-opiate. You're inducing opiate constipation. You could use morphine just as well. It's just that if you use morphine, the child might sleep more. But um, why is it Lomotil doesn't have CNS effects? And the reason is it's a, a very potent ligand for a brain-to-blood transporter. Uh, if, you, if you were to give Lomotil to an animal that has that transporter knocked out, Lamotil acts just like morphine, has CNS effects, analgesia, et cetera, et cetera. There's many transporters uh, in the brain, uh, efflux transporters, but the king for drug development is peak glycoprotein. As you can see, 
it has a lot of different classes that it uses. Maybe 30 to 40 percent of the drugs that we're using um, have, to some degree, uh, uh, are efflux pump uh, or, or uh, PGP substrates, either strong, in which the case they're kept out of the brain almost completely and don't have CNS effects, or weak, in which case they can have have effects. Um, and the that wouldn't be so bad, but but PGP is highly variable. There's an interesting pharmacogenomics. There's about 30% of people who have increased expression and therefore are keeping drugs out of the brain better than the rest of us, and about 25% with decreased expression, and therefore more sensitive to CNS drugs. Um, and there are examples of which this is a big problem. NeuroAIDS, uh, for example, is largely thought uh, the CNS acts as a reservoir for the virus for reinfection of the body simply because all of the um, dr drugs are pumped out of the brain and they're unable to accumulate in uh, therapeutic levels in the CNS. And interestingly, about 30% of folks are resistant to our seizure medications with the exception of alproic acid. Interestingly, all of our seizure medications with the exception of alproic acid are uh, PGP substrates. So again, this has been very important to us uh, without us realizing it uh, since the inception of trying to treat CNS uh, conditions. And perhaps most interesting is the last few years, we now know that PGP is also modulated or regulated by inflammatory events. So imagine what we're doing. We're going to ICUs and places like this, and of course almost every disease now has a pro, we realize has a pro-inflammatory component. And we're, we're treating the CNS with a moving target here of how much drug we're actually getting to, to the brain. And actually, our merit review at the VA is to, is to look at some aspects of control of this. So to summarize this, this is a wonderful article written by a good friend of mine, uh, Nigel Grieg, at NIA a few years ago. These are the fundamental uh, things that control getting drug into the brain. These and some variant thereof. And it's really pretty simple. We've talked about lipid solubility, which relies on the uh, membrane diffusion, which relies on the characteristics of the, uh, of the uh, drug, primarily lipid solubility and molecular weight. And if you have a transport system, this is great. If you cross the blood-brain barrier really, really fast, like glucose, uh, cerebral blood flow is important, so that the faster the transport, the faster the blood flow, the faster the drug delivery. If you're getting in slowly, it's not such a big deal. Working against you are efflux pumps, degradation in the blood, the brain, and at the blood-brain barrier. There are some substances where the blood-brain barrier acts as a barrier because of its enzymatic properties, not because of its, of its physical properties. Uh, PK issues, clearance, and uh, tissue uptake, which includes protein binding. And with that, you now know more about drug delivery to the central nervous system than 90% of the people working in, pharma in uh, pharmaceutical industry trying to develop drugs for the CNS. Believe it or not, this is really a very horrible thing. They're black boxing the blood-brain barrier by and large and uh, trying not to get into its vagaries. Nonetheless, in, in uh, some places, particularly in academics, this is actually a short list of strategies for drug delivery. Uh, but right now, it's, it's rather uh, disconcerting to uh, see um, how little engaged uh, uh, this information is being applied to, to drug delivery. Now I want to switch and talk about uh, an area that I like, given that the blood-brain barrier is this regulatory interface, when it breaks, disease can occur. And that's what I like to study. I call these Charlie Brown syndromes because Charlie Brown said my brain and my body, I'm sorry, my, my body and my brain haven't spoken to each other in years. And of course the body and the brain, I'm looking for areas where the reason they're not speaking is because of problems with the blood-brain barrier. And we actually have a lot of these things. Of course, we can have a disrupted blood-brain barrier where things leak in. But that's old hat. I'm looking for, for changes in the regulatory aspects. And we're getting a, a nice list. Uh, the first two I'll talk about in some depth. I've already talked about glucose transporter in de vivo syndrome. Uh, I don't know if you guys call, call it de vivo syndrome or not, but de vivo calls it de vivo syndrome. So, um, but this is when you have a deficient number of glucose transporters across the blood-brain barrier. Results in uh, mental retardation, seizures, et cetera, et cetera. Multiple sclerosis has long been considered to sort of originate with problems in the blood-brain barrier, and there's some other things that we've talked about in part. Um, to give you an example of a cytokine problem, uh, Fulton Cruz published this a few years ago, uh, and so what he gave was a lipopolysaccharide, uh, the uh, cell wall of a, of a gram-negative bacteria, which activates the innate immune system. 
And this releases TNF in the blood, which is showed then crosses the blood-brain barrier by a saturable transport system, which actually our lab described a number of years ago. There it interacts at microglia to release still more TNF from endogenous brain sources. And these two together uh, work on the neuron and uh, decrease uh, no, uh, dopamine sur uh, neuron survival in the substantia nigra. And therefore, maybe this is a pathway by which inflammation could contribute to Parkinson's. We showed a very similar uh, pathway a few years before this with interleukin-1-alpha, which has long been known to induce sickness behavior. That's when you get the flu or a cold like that, and you don't, you don't feel like eating or making love or watching TV. You just want to sleep. That's an adaptive syndrome, so it's not really quite a disease. It's short-term, it's adaptive. We showed that that works by interleukin crossing the blood-brain barrier by its own saturable transporter at the posterior division of the septum and thereby in engaging uh, those neurons and the outflow therefrom uh, affecting all those behaviors. Don't expect you to really ingest this slide completely. It's supposed to be complicated. The main point here is that uh, the blood-brain barrier is intimately involved in neuroimmune communication. And as this aspect becomes increasingly important for almost every disease that we think about, uh, again, the blood-brain barrier will be in, right in the middle of all of this. But what I'd like to talk about is how the blood-brain barrier is intimately involved in feeding behavior as an example of, of, a, of a behavior uh, in which uh, uh, it can, helps the brain and the, and the peripheral tissues communicate. So just to start the story at the beginning, back in 1950, this was at the heyday when scientists, uh, with some companies decided if they could produce white mice and white rats, that this would uh, really be a big boon to scientists, and scientists would use those instead of going out and having to grab their, their own guinea pigs or, or medical students to do their research on. And uh, early on, there was this phenotype change. And you can see the mouse uh, over here is so much fatter than this one. I mean, three grams. This is spectacular. And I'm sure you all appreciate that. And with time, there was a little bit more differential change as well. <laughs> so this is the OBOB -OB mouse, uh, OB for obesity gene. And uh, sort of things were forgotten for a couple of decades. And then about circa 1960, a guy named Coleman came up with the idea that he thought obesity was um, a hormonal disease. Uh, but he couldn't figure out, was, did the, was, the, was the rat fat, uh, the mouse fat, because he had something in the blood that made him fat? Or was he fat because he was missing something in the blood to make him thin? So now you can all vote on this. Um, and the answer, so what he did, he took a thin rat, a thin uh, litter mate to the OBLB and an OB tied together their circulation, so they shared their bloodstreams, and looked at what happened. And what happened was that the fat mouse became thin. So the OBLB mouse is fat because it's missing something in the blood. Again, this was forgotten pretty much. People went on to serotonin and dopamine and, and, will, and power, uh, willpower and everything else. Until about 1994, and Jeff Friedman in the first modern application of the new fields of, of molecular biology found, the, found what this protein was. And the protein was, um, was leptin, uh, named uh, leptos from the Greek word leptos for thin. For some reason, everybody in the obesity field likes to use Greek terms, Greek roots instead of Latin. And this is the way it should work. This is the way it's supposed to work. The fat mass secretes leptin. Of course, now we know the fat is really a big endocrine tissue, but this was one of the first things that we had found. We always thought fat was just storage before then. The more fat mass you have, the higher leptin is, the higher leptin is in the blood. Now, leptin is a molecule of 16,000 Daltons, one-fourth the size of albumin, would be excluded from the blood-brain barrier. Uh, but there's a transport system for the leptin across the blood-brain barrier. And so it enters the central nervous system, and there works at its receptor at the arcuate nucleus. Actually, we now know that there's leptin receptors all over the brain, but uh, they're primarily <coughs> the biggest concentration of the arcuate nucleus, where it does things that inhibit feeding and does things that increase thermogenesis. Since uh, you're eating less, burning more calories, that reduces your fat mass. So what we have here is a beautiful negative feedback loop. And if this worked perfectly the way it, sh it looks here, we would all be ideal body weight, whatever that is. But we would all be ideal body weight. Obviously, something goes wrong. So where does the system break? Well, 
Oh, oh and this is just uh, to show you formally how we actually look at things crossing the blood-brain barrier. The red line, we've re radioactively labeled leptin, injected intravenously. We see that it goes up over time when we plot the brain serum ratios over exposure time. This is a multi, uh, this is a, a, a multiple time reg linear regression analysis. We repeat that, exp so we should say leptin's crossing, we repeat it with a saturating dose of unlabeled leptin, goes down, so we know it's crossing and crossing by a saturable transport system. So this is the sort of thing we do in my lab. Plus we have to then remove the radioactivity, make sure it's still there. Well, leptin and that kind of thing, and that's a lot of work there. But this is basically the experiment. It's very easy. So if anybody's looking for a new field to get in, blood brain barrier, come over and we got lots of projects. <laughs> so these, there are five places where this thing could break, and all five places uh, we have uh, both either human or animal or both areas of, um, of disruption, including blood brain barrier problems. Uh, so where, of the, where could these, uh, could this, break to produce human obesity. And we got our first clue not long after leptin was discovered. And that is that unlike the OBOB mouse, obese humans have high leptin, not low leptin. And therefore, we have a resistance to the function of leptin as we get increasingly obese. And there are, are three areas where one could produce such a condition, obese people or obese animals uh, with high serum leptin. One's a defect that transported the blood-brain barrier. Another is the classic receptor post receptor defect, or the other is a lesion in downstream neural circuitries. Uh, we know that at five, uh, lesions at the downstream neural circuitries actually accounts for about 4% of obesity in humans, in that a receptor to the MSH protein uh, is defective. But in garden variety obesity, the other 96% uh, downstream neural circuitries seem to be intact. And the lesions are dual. They start at the blood-brain barrier, and as obesity advances, they increasingly become also at the receptor, post-receptor. So they're kind of simultaneous, but with the blood-brain barrier leading. The first evidence for this came actually in 97, back-to-back -back papers from the group of Halas and Van Heek. And they showed that if you start taking a normal animal, a normal mouse, and you start making them obese by giving them a high-fat diet, they will go through a stage when they still respond to the leptin put into the brain, but no longer respond to the leptin given peripherally, therefore having trouble getting into the brain. Um, and uh, part of the reason is, again, because of this saturable transport system. That uh, This is a composite of uh, various studies measuring CSF and serum leptin in normals, obese, uh, and in some disease states. And we see that uh, very quickly, uh, leptin begins to saturate out. Interestingly, the uh, saturation begins rather low levels, about 5 or 10 nanograms per mil, and that's more or less considered the, the same range as what we would consider ideal body weight. And this has given rise to some various ideas, very interesting evolutionary ideas, I won't have time to talk about them today, that perhaps our version of ideal body weight is also a little bit already towards the obese side. Um, our lab was the first to actually show uh, pharmacokinetically that leptin transport is indeed impaired in the obese animals, and this, will, this is o true over and over and over again, no matter which kind of model that you look at. It's been uh, replicated by five or six labs now, but uh, just to show you that um, as, you, as body weight increases, body weight due to adiposity increases, uh, transport of leptin goes down. And this interestingly turns out to be uh, in part mediated, the leptin transporter is regulated, and one of the regulatory aspects is triglycerides, which is interesting because that's the main dyslipidemia in metabolic syndrome. Uh, triglycerides impair the transport of leptin across the blood-brain barrier. So this is sort of the way that we think it works normally. Uh, imagine, and it works best if you think about the evolutionary conditions of which animals evolved or what, perhaps how our ancestors were evolved. Um, at least this one. So uh, what happens is that some days you get more calories than you use and some days you get fewer. Now that's not starvation and sort of like, uh, you know, some paychecks you've spent more money and some paychecks you've spent less money than you make. So you use your bank account to sort of hold that, that, uh, that amount in reserve or to draw on it. That's what we do with our fat mass. The fat mass uh, releases leptin uh, proportionate to uh, its size. And uh, an aspect of this, a portion of this, crosses the blood-brain barrier, shuts off feeding, 
and allows, leptin is permissive for all kinds of other things, from neurodegeneration, uh, the, uh, repro uh, um, letting the reproductive system go forward, affecting memory, uh, affecting immune function, et cetera, et cetera. And so all those use calories. And so that seems to be sort of the way that leptin works. In starvation, uh, a lot of breaks are put on. And this is probably one reason why uh, starvation diets don't work, because even if you still have your fat mass, about 12 to 24 hours after you begin to, to stop eating completely, the fat stops pr producing so much leptin. It, it greatly decreases the amount of leptin. It begins to make sense. If you're all of a sudden your body realizes you're starving, you don't want to put a break on, a, on, on your, ability, your desire to go out and eat. Fat mass uh, is, begins to mobilize uh, the, the fat that it contains, uh, and so triglycerides go up in the brain as do free fatty acids, and those then further block the transport of leptin. The uh, break on feeding is removed, and the permissive effect on all those things that are using to burn up calories uh, is also removed. So you stop doing all these things, and you start really focusing on getting more food. So there we have sort of a classic feeding uh, way that the blood-brain barrier could be involved in a, in a feeding aspect. Now I want to talk in the last few minutes about some of our work that we're doing on Alzheimer's disease. Um, actually, there's a lot of theories on interactions of either the cerebral vasculature, which as you can now see is sort of a synonymous term in some ways for the blood-brain barrier, or the blood-brain barrier directly and Alzheimer's disease. Currently writing a review for um, advanced drug deliveries reviews and have expanded this with about four other mechanisms, but the idea is that there's a lot of ways that the blood-brain barrier have been proposed to interact in, in AD. A lot of these are theoretical. The one that is very interesting, though, I'm going to talk to you about, um, takes as its beginning the observation that although essentially all patients with Alzheimer's have increased amyloid beta levels in the brain, 99% um, garden variety, except for the familials, um, do not have an overproduction of APP. So we're not overproducing APP leading to A-beta, and if we're not doing that, the other way that you get elevated levels is to affect uh, disposal. And there's two ways to affect disposal. The classic way for any hormone is by enzymatic degradation, and hence there's a lot of work looking at the enzymes that control the processing of APP and A-beta. But the other way is clearance, and because we're at, inside the central nervous system, the clearance is across the blood-brain barrier or with reabsorption of cerebral spinal fluid. And there's evidence that both of these are deficient in Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's at least two transporters. Well, there's one transporter for sure that's involved in the efflux of amyloid beta protein out of the brain. Uh, that's uh, L the LDL receptor, LRP1. And there's increasingly strong evidence that at least one other one, the PGP guy, once again, is, is active. But I'm going to focus on, on LRP1 for right now. Good friend, uh, Betsy Zlakovic, um, uh, came up with the theory of the neurovascular hypothesis, the neuro, sorry, neurovascular theory, and this states simply, because he had noted that in uh, tissues, brain tissues, uh, path tissue from AD patients, all the LRP had gone away. So he suggested that it's the loss of the efflux allows accumulation of amyloid beta protein in the brain, contributes to that uh, accumulation, and therefore contributes to the advancement of AD. And this is uh, not only true in uh, patients, but uh, all the animal models that we've looked at, both the transgenic and the natural mutations, also develop this problem with uh, efflux as time goes on. So uh, I first met Betza in uh, 1987, my first scientific meeting in a country that doesn't exist anymore, um, in Yugoslavia. I mean, we always hear about these crazy scientists. This is Betza at a young age. He was given a choice by his government either to become a scientist or an operatic sing singer, and he, uh, he's got this great <laughs> baritone voice, and uh, he chose science, luckily, although his wife is a concert pianist. So we wanted to test this neurovascular hypothesis, and the way we did it is we built um, two antisenses to LRP. We've shown that there's a class of antisense we can get directly into the brain or, or can be taken up by the blood-brain barrier, so we built two of those directed against LRP. So the idea was that if this hypothesis is correct, wouldn't we decrease LRP expression at the blood-brain barrier? We should get decreased A-beta efflux out of the brain and therefore increased A-beta levels in the brain. And that ought to do something to learning and memory. 
So this is first, uh, we showed that the antisenses actually worked. We used uh, controls, untreated animals, as well as random antisenses. Um, and what we show is that indeed our antisenses knock down LRP by about 50% or so in brain capillaries. This is an in vitro experiment. We then, um, that, those, are, those are just the capillaries you just pull right out of the brain. Then we plated them uh, in a very elegant in vitro model of the blood-brain barrier. And uh, in vitro, the uh, blood-brain barrier, the brain endothelial cells will orient so that their brain side is up into the dish and their blood side is down into the dish. So you can look at efflux experiments, bidirectional experiments. And again, our antisenses decreased A beta efflux. Uh, this, the first panel, uh, the panel on your right, uh, sorry, on your left, shows that uh, the transporter was there and that we could inhi inhibit it with unlabeled A beta. And then the other panel shows that the um, antisense uh, inhibited that transporter. So same thing going on here. Uh, then we went to in vivo experiments uh, and we developed a method a number of years ago where we can actually look at brain to blood efflux in vivo and this is just sort of the method slide for that. Won't belabor the pharmacokinetics. And again, when we gave uh, immediately on the left we see that within 24 hours after giving this cocktail we inhibited a beta efflux. The, uh, the uh, slide on the right shows that uh, other antisenses, uh, uh, th again, that it, that it worked. This is a, another kind of method. We also have an antisense that decreases APP secretion and uh, transport went up. That actually makes sense because we're removing the endogenous material, the inhibitor. But uh, the main point here is that, again, when we go to the in vivo system, uh, and this is, this is giving the antisenses ICV as well as the A-beta ICV, we're able to inhibit the transporter. So then um, we went longer chronic studies, uh, giving the antisense for a week, and uh, in vivo, then pulled out the capillaries in vivo, and we showed that, uh, again, the LRP was decreased, and the efflux was decreased, and that A-beta levels were indeed increased in the brain. So now we're ready to say, if all this is happening, are we indeed really affecting learning and memory? We picked... Um, Memory, because it's remote from treatment, and therefore, if somehow the antisense were making the animal sick or something, so we train the animal, then we give the drug, then one week later, we come back and we, we look at memory. So that way, we're unable to get, uh, we, we don't affect the learning process, and we don't, uh, because the drug's given after that, and we don't look at sick, an sick animals. We don't think the antisense makes them sick, but this was just a cute trick that we could use to put some time between drug treatment and its effect. So we're really dealing with memory consolidation here. And indeed, we taught these animals some pretty fancy tricks. Actually, it was active avoidance. We did some other things too. Open and, and indeed, um, their memory increased, um, uh, uh, learning improved. Um, and uh, we also, uh, open field behavior wasn't changed, so we weren't changing motor activity. We also did object recognition, which is sort of becoming more the accepted test, uh, uh, as opposed to water morris maze and that kind of thing. And we improved memory there as well. So we, we accomplished all of these uh, aspects that we wanted uh, and concluded, therefore, that impaired A-beta efflux by LRP may indeed be a contributor to Alzheimer's disease. So again, Using this formulation, we can say that the blood-brain barrier is contrib contributing to AD. So uh, this is really my talk um, that I would like to give certain broad conclusions. Uh, this is, as you can see, is really a propaganda talk for blood-brain barrier. Um, the blood-brain barrier is a regulatory interface, not just a brick wall. It's important, uh, has important roles in physiological regulation, and when those get uh, perturbed, we wind up with disease conditions and it's also important for drug delivery. Um, there's one other aspect I, I won't talk about. I just want to show you because I love the slide. And when this, a number of years ago, we did work on blood-brain barrier regulating methionine and caffeine and alcohol drinking. And I uh, won't talk about it, but I'll show you the slide. Um, and that's my talk. I'd like uh -huh. to take questions. So how do I do this? this. Yes, sir. The um, recent work uh, by Suzanne Kraft and folks about insulin, I'm wondering what your thoughts are in relation to the blood brain barrier. Yeah, so um, insulin does cross the blood brain barrier. <laughs> that actually was uh, solidly shown by a group in Seattle. Uh, 
uh, 19, circa 1977 Woods and Port. There's actually a long history before that, which is really entertaining, but they really sort of are credited with nailing it, and rightfully so. Our lab subsequently looked at the pharmacokinetics of that and showed that indeed it's crossing. And Suzanne's early studies actually did show that you could give insulin and improve uh, aspects in AD. She was roundly criticized. Uh, anytime you do anything interesting in science, you're going to be roundly criticized. <laughs> so right away, we knew she was on something. Um, because there's all these peripheral effects of insulin, and so she moved to, to intranasal. Um, we started doing intranasal uh, long before I moved to Seattle, maybe seven or eight years ago. Our first paper was Matthew During, looking at GI uh, substances. And so we became very interested in that. Um, and it's an interesting pathway. Many substances do get into the brain through the intranasal route. Um, there are actually now examples of substances that distribute throughout the brain in areas even higher than the front first part that the brain hits. So there's a lot of interesting things going on we don't understand. And we have some unpublished data that we've done with our um, colleagues in St. Louis in an AD model showing that intranasal insulin can affect their learning and memory. So we're very interested to go over and look at some of the basic science aspects. The, um, the other lead to that is it's very interesting that almost all the GI hormones have big time effects on, on learning and memory and attention and this thing going back all the way, I guess originally to the 70s, 60s and 70s work by David and Kasten showing MSH affects attention. Um, Ghrelin, leptin, insulin. Uh, it's, it's, hard to, it's, hard, it's hard to think of a GI hormone that doesn't have big time effects on learning and memory. And so sometimes uh, when I'm talking drug delivery, I sort of say, you know, the, what's the biggest class of endogenous substances that we should be investigating for AD? And it's the GI hormones, I think. And many of them crossing the blood-brain barrier already. So, yes, sir. Your LRP studies and the, and the increasing A beta in the brains of the rats was interesting. When we think about AD and the accumulation of amyloid, the natural thought is we're progressively generating neurons that are leading to progressive impairment of cognitive functioning. Mm -hmm. But the model you used acutely increased A beta in the rat, and a week later you're testing them. Have you come yeah. in on both the time issues and the kind of mediation issues? Yeah, um, there. This is actually very classic for animal studies, uh, even to take. Uh, transgenics who are pumping out, you know, A beta like crazy uh, for a year of their life, and you treat them with, say, an A beta antibodies directly into the CNS. You can get very quickly, and you can get improvement in their their CNS. And um, I think this is a very interesting aspect because there is a real disconnect right now between, the, it, it, which very few people have drawn attention to, between the clinical literature and the clinical thinking, and what's coming out of the basic science. So if you talk to most people who are, are coming from the clinical direction for, for treatment of uh, AD, they're saying we've got to diagnose it early. We've got to do early imaging because the, the neurons die off and we can't replace them. And, and therefore, we can't cure Alzheimer's. We can't set the clock back. The, the basic scientists say, no way. We're taking these guys. They have real profound cognitive dis uh, defects. I mean, these guys are thick as a brick. And they can't remember anything and we can treat them acutely. It's a neurotoxic model in the, in the animals. So we're saying, oh, no way. We want, we're after it. We're going to cure this disease. We're going to reverse it, at least in those people with moderate to moderately severe. I think we can bring back function big time. Thanks for that question. And are there neuropathological correlates of both the acute effects of A-beta and the responses that oh. would suggest that you're getting, you know, regeneration of neurons or something else to, to reverse? Yep, yep. Uh, we have... I think about a dozen papers using looking at our antisense that knocks down APP. So uh, mostly we've used the SAMP8 mouse, which is a natural mutation overexpressing A beta. And if we treat these animals, actually it's also we can get m these similar results if we treat them with, with an antibodies, powerful antibodies directed against A beta. But these animals have cognitive, I'm sorry, they have cholinergic defects which are reversed. They have oxidative stress effects, which are reversed. Preliminary data looks like that they have neuroinflammatory problems, that are, which are reversed, as well as the cognitive effects. So they look very much like an AD brain, uh, except they don't, get, they don't get hard plaques. The uh, transgenics do, but you know, more and more people are thinking it's the ligamers that are more important than the plaques. Uh, and this model actually would argue for that. Uh, but other than that, they look very much like an AD brain, uh, biochemically. 
and we reverse those things and uh, get the cognitive effects too. And about, yeah. Propaganda works. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Do you, do you have anything to say about the concern about aluminum accumulation in, in the plaques of Alzheimer's? Yeah. So my 12th paper was published in Lancet. Um, so we were, I was always interested in how informational molecules cross, like peptides. And uh, it, was all, it was very controversial then. But um, so I just, uh, we, had, we had looked at aluminum and found that aluminum increased the transport of peptides and everything across the blood-brain barrier. A lot of that work had been published in Lancet. So we thought, well, and, and a lot of aluminum work had been, uh, was, it was a very hot topic then for, so we actually wrote the, the title, Aluminum Increases Neuropeptides Across the Blood-Brain Barrier, saying this could be a mechanism by which aluminum is neurotoxic. So we got that published in a premier journal. Uh, aluminum, since it's faded away, and peptides are no longer controversial. So I guess that's another form of propaganda. At any rate, um, so aluminum is definitely a neurotoxin. It's in dialysis, dementia, and that kind of thing. Um, I have colleagues who still believe it plays a role in AD. Um, I think we have, I, I, I don't think that that's really strong evidence. Most of it's gone to epidemiological evidence. Um, so I'm not really sort of a proponent of that as a role in AD. Um, certainly it, it, uh, it plays uh, other roles. And for us, it was a very useful compound because um, it would inhibit transport systems and it would increase substances across the blood-brain barrier by membrane diffusion. So aluminum for a while in our lab became a real interesting tool, a cheap way to do things that were more expensive, uh, more time-consuming to do in other ways. Yes? There's a recent study reversing the physiology of Alzheimer's disease in fruit flies and mice, and also they regain their cognitive skills. Um, but what I think I heard you say is, is all of your research with non-humans? Um, well, all of, all of the AD research, yes. All of the AD research is with non-humans. Yeah. Yeah. Very exciting. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you.